Part 3 of this tutorial series will cover rule-based modeling in more depth. First, we'll look at how to model an urban district all at once, driven by attractors and randomness. So, the download folder with all of the source files for this has a Rhino file called SiteModel3DM, which you should open up, and a couple Grasshopper files. We're only going to be walking through massmodeling.gh in detail, but I've provided this one and I'll show you a little bit later just what it is. Um, but uh, we can pull open mass modeling just to get a sense of what it is we're going to build. Um, turning off preview here, this is sort of an automatic model of an entire district in 3D. Um, we can also uh, turn on our context meshes to see this in three dimensions. Um, but we're gonna be building this one from scratch. So go ahead and start a fresh grasshopper definition and we will go from there. So the first thing that we want to establish in order to kind of lay out our little three-dimensional district is we want to set up a grid, which is going to be the basis for our layout. And in this file, I've already set up a series of curves here on the grid drivers U and V layers, um, which are curves that all run in consistent directions, so all of the V curves run in one direction. If I turn on the DIR command, we should be able to see that direction. And similarly, with the U curves, they all run in a consistent direction, and they compose a network. They don't have to touch exactly, but they more or less make up a grid, even if it's a distorted one. So in order to take advantage of that and create a base grid, we're actually gonna construct a surface that passes through all of those, and we're going to use the parameter space of that surface as a way to sort of start as our, to use as kind of the basis for our uh, massing. So first we're gonna need to load these in. So I'm gonna grab two curve parameters, and I'm gonna label them as the U-curves and the V curves, whoops. And for this, it's important that we select these curves in order because the command we're gonna to use to construct a surface requires that they be in a proper order. So we're gonna right click and choose set multiple and go this way, selecting them one by one, and then hit enter, and then do the same for the V curves. And you may have to turn that layer on if it wasn't on. and then hit enter, and we're going to use a component called network surface in order to create a surface through all of these curves. So under freeform network surface, we can provide a series of U-curves and V-curves, and it will create a surface that passes through all of these curves. Um, now, this surface, we haven't talked too much about surfaces yet, but I think you probably understood some from your introductory Rhino tutorials, that there's kind of a UV parameter space, which is how the control points are distributed. And this network surface component is going to take advantage of the sort of shape of these curves in order to decide how to lay out its grid. And we'll see that here in a second when we subdivide the surface. So if we want to get a subcomponent of this grid, um, like a you know a sort of region within it that follows the logic of the grid we're going to use a component called subsurface under surface util isotrim it's isotrim but you can see the nickname is subsurface and this takes a surface and a two-dimensional domain uh, of that surface now we're going to, just as a demo, construct a single two-dimensional domain, just so you can kind of see how this works. So under the Maths tab, Domain, Construct 2D Domain, and you'll see there are two versions of this. Uh, we want the one that's sort of like a square, uh, not the one that has two little domains going into it. And we'll plug this in. And by default, this is the domain from 0 to 1 in the u direction and 0 to 1 in the v direction. And so you'd expect that we'd get the whole surface back. Um, but as it turns out, this surface's parameter space is not guaranteed to follow that. In fact, it doesn't look like we're getting, we're probably getting something somewhere. Yeah, if we zoom in, we're getting a tiny, tiny piece. Now that doesn't dimensionally mean that this is one on this side and one on that side. It just means that that's how this parameter space is laid out. So for consistency's sake, what we usually do is take any surface that we want to operate on through its parameter space and re-parameterize it, which basically just resets its domain 
to be from 0, 0 to 1, 1. So as soon as I do that, this subsurface now takes up the entire, uh, the entire surface. And if I adjust this domain with a series of sliders, just grab a few of these so we can see, uh, I can control kind of the bottom edge and the top edge of this surface as we extract it and the left edge and the right edge and so on. So we're basically extracting what's called an isoparametric subset of the surface that we're dealing with. Um, but instead of just manually creating a domain, although we could do that, and there are lots of interesting things you can do by manually constructing these subdomains of the surface, we just want to divide it sort of evenly in its parameter space. And I'm going to turn off my driver layers over here in Rhino. And what I want to do is divide the domain of the surface itself. So I'm going to go back over here to Maths domain, divide domain. And make sure that you use the one with the little two because we're dividing a two-dimensional domain. And if you plug a surface into a two-dimensional domain component, it will automatically convert it to the domain of that surface, which is really handy. So we're going to use two sliders. And I'm just going to initialize them at 5. And we can see how this looks. I'm doing that by double-clicking and typing 5. And if we plug this in, we now get a subdivision of our surface that follows the grid that we established. And as we manipulate it, we can sort of see uh, more or fewer of these subdivisions in either one of these directions. So this is a nice way to create kind of a distorted grid condition using a network surface in tandem with our sort of divide subsurface routine. So. We also would like to offset these inwards to get sort of some alleys and streets in between them. Um, and there are a couple different ways to do this. For the purposes of this tutorial, what I'm going to do is grab the area centroid of each one of these surfaces. You see we have a list here. And so I want to get the area of this surface. I'm going to double click and type area. That lives in surface analysis area, in case you need it that way. And this gives us both an area count, but what we're really interested in is the area centroid of each one of these surfaces, which is what we're going to use to scale about. Now, there are also faster and different ways to grab centers, but for now, this should be fine. And then we're going to go to the Transform tab and find the Scale uh, Transform, which is an affine transformation. So under the Affine sub-tab, we're going to grab Scale. And we're going to use the center point of the geometry as the center of scaling. And then grab all of these surfaces and plug them in. And then create a slider that goes from 0 to 1. And as a shortcut, I'm just going to type 0.5 to give myself a slider that I can use. And if I turn off the preview of these other components, and maybe this guy as well, you'll see that we're sort of offsetting everything roughly inward. Now, it's not a proper offset, but it's good enough for our purposes. If we go to about 0.8, we get some sort of gaps in between our parcels. So now we want to employ something called conditional logic, where we want to do one thing to some of these and another thing to some others based on some condition, which in this case is going to be the area of these surfaces. So we have already measured the area, but just to be safe, let's do it again on our scaled copy. So I'm going to use Control c Control v with this area component in order to make a second copy of it. And we're going to get back a list of the areas of each one of these surfaces. And what we want to do is only extract those that are larger than a certain threshold value. So what we're going to do is use a mathematical test. Uh, so under the Maths tab, Operators, we're going to grab a larger than. And we can plug in this number A. And then another slider, which I'm going to set to just be 30,000. Double click and type 30,000. Um, and this is going to return a series of Boolean values, which are false wherever the, uh, the area is uh, below 30,000 and true wherever it's above. So if we use these Boolean values in tandem with a component called dispatch, uh, so we'll just double click and search for dispatch. This lives under sets list dispatch if you need it. Um, 
This takes a list of any data and then a list of Boolean values and we're going to grab our scaled surfaces of the data to dispatch and then use these Boolean values. Now, it won't look like anything has changed, even if I turn off preview here, but it has split out our parcels into separate lists. So we can see that I've got a few of these in the A, which represents any place where this value was true, and a few in the B, any place where it was false. So. Having done this, we can apply a different parametric operation to the large parcels and maybe do something different or do nothing at all to the smaller parcels. So let's try that. So we're going to rely on the same kind of thing we did over here where we subdivided our surfaces. And in fact, I'm just going to copy this entire thing, which grabs divide with a U count of E count slider and then a subsurface component. And what we want to do is divide our uh, large parcels even further. So we're doing a secondary subdivision. So like I said before, we can convert a surface to its domain uh, by passing it into a parameter that expects a 2D domain. And then we can plug it in over here to get a subsurface. Now, this isn't going to work right off the bat. If we turn on preview, you'll see what's happening is we're getting a bunch of surfaces on one of these, but it isn't even really subdividing all the way, and then individual ones on the end. When you see a pattern like this, it's a good indicator that you have some kind of data structure mismatch between the inputs of your components. So if we look, another clue is that we've got different kinds of wires going into this component, and this is a sort of one to many component with multiple sort of individual inputs. And what we want to do is make sure that for all of our domains that we're providing, so we're providing a list of lists of domains, but only a single list of surfaces. So we want to make sure that our surfaces are each placed in their own branch so that they will correspond to the data structure of this one. And we can achieve that by grafting, which is to say basically putting each one of those surfaces on its own list. And now when I hover over these inputs, I've got 0 to 11, so my 12 branches, and then my 12 branches over here, which match up. And now it is going to subdivide each one of those surfaces. Now, those subdivisions look a little extreme to me, so I'm going to drop this down to 3 and maybe 1. And now we get some sort of nice, reasonably sized subdivisions for those large parcels. And then the smaller parcels uh, stay as they are. So what we want to do is take these results and merge them back together. So under uh, sets and tree merge, then we can take this data, all of our sort of subdivided parcels, and all of our original parcels from the B output, which are the ones that we didn't process this way. And I'm going to turn off preview over here. And now we've got a nice list of some subdivided surfaces and some unsubdivided surfaces. Now, the data structure of this guy is going to be a little bit funny. So just to make things easy on ourselves, we're going to flatten it and make it into a single list so that every surface is treated the same way as we move forward. So the next thing we want to do is play with extruding these up by differing heights on the basis of their proximity to some attractor, whether that be an attractor point or an attractor curve. So I'm going to create a point param to start, so under params point, and I'm going to call this attractor point. And I'm going to actually create a point in Rhino. Um, I'm going to just put it on the default layer. Actually, no, I've already got a layer set up called attractors point. And I am going to draw, oh, it looks like I even already have one built into the file. So I'm going to select it and right click and choose set multiple. That's just a different flow. It's the same thing as saying right click, set one, and then going to select it. But if you pre-select, you can use select multiple uh, and it will just load in right away. Sometimes I prefer that. And so what we want to do is say, all right, based on the distance from this point to all of these parcels, extrude the ones that are closest to it the most and the ones that are furthest from it the least. 
So let's figure out how to do that. Again, we're going to need a point from each of these surfaces. This time I'm going to use a different mechanism for grabbing a point from the center of an object, which is a little bit faster since we're working with a slightly longer list here. And that is you can pass any piece of geometry through an evaluate box component. So if we search for evaluate box, this component expects a bounding box, but it, we can rely on the fact that when you convert any piece of geometry into a bounding box type, it just grabs the bounding box of that geometry. And this defaults to input values of 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, which will be right at the center of the geometry. So it's a very fast way to grab the center point of any given object. So now we've got a point for each one of our surfaces, and we've got our attractor point. And we want to measure the distance between these points and this point. So let's go ahead and I believe under the vector tab, under point, we can grab distance. And we'll take the distance between each one of these. And since we're comparing many values to a single value, we'll get a list of values back which represent the distances for each one of those surfaces. Now, these distances are in whatever units your Rhino model is in. Um, and we want some numbers that are a little easier to work with. Um, and a common pattern in many different grasshopper contexts is to want to reset the numbers you're working with to be in the range between 0 and 1. So with a curve domain or a surface domain, we can use reparameterize to automatically convert back to the space from 0 to 1. But if we want to do it ourselves, it takes a couple more steps. So first, we need to find the bounds of this domain. Um, so we're going to go over here to math, actually. And under domain, uh, we're going to use bounds. And when you feed bounds a list of numbers, it returns the domain of those numbers from the smallest value in the list to the largest value in the list. Then we can use that with another component from maths called remap. And we're going to feed in these distance values as the value to remap. And this bounds is our source domain. And we're going to leave the target domain at its default, which is 0 to 1. So what this is going to do is take all of our actual distance values and remap them into the space from 0 to 1, maintaining their proportional relationships, but making sure that their range is now within that domain, because this is the source domain that we specified. So having done that, we have numbers that we can work with a bit more readily. And what we're going to do is construct another domain. So instead of using 0 to 1, now we want to convert this to the domain of the range of heights that we want to achieve. So back under maths, we're going to use construct domain. And I'm just going to do 10, double click type 10 for a slider initialized, and double click type 100. Actually, just to make this easier to see, let's go up to like 400. And we'll plug these in. And we're going to use these to create a z vector, which we will extrude our parcels with. So we've seen before we grab the vector from vector tab and convert our numbers into vectors in the z direction, and then use that in tandem with surface freeform extrude, which will let us specify a list of surfaces, which remember is our sort of merged list where we put together our subdivided surfaces and our unsubdivided surfaces, and this z vector. And now, as I move this point around in space, I have this gumball on, which you can turn on with the little gumball tab down here. It just makes it easier to control. Um, those parcels that are close to that uh, point are much lower, and the ones that are further from it are much higher, and they follow kind of a linear progression. You can see there's sort of a direct slope down to wherever this point is located. So, but maybe we want even a little bit more control than that. So there are a few things we can do to manipulate these values even further. And one of my favorites is actually to take advantage of a component called the graph mapper. So we're going to need to carve out a little space for ourselves over here in the grasshopper definition. So I'm going to spread this guy back out. 
And I'm actually going to take this second domain and move it over here momentarily because what we want to do is disconnect it, which you can do by holding down control and connecting the wire from one to the other. That'll actually detach that. Um, you can also right click and choose disconnect if there is something plugged into it. So over here, disconnect domain. And we're going to feed the values from this remap component that we set to be from zero to one through a component called the graph mapper. So if you go over to params, util, look for this guy, graph mapper. And we're going to feed these values in. And then we're going to use a second remap component from maths domain remap. And then this is going to be our target domain. So it might seem funny to have remap in here twice. Um, if we were to just hook this directly in, it would be exactly the same as what we had before. We're just doing it in two steps instead of one. So map from a source domain to zero to one, and then map from zero to one to a target domain, which is the same as just mapping directly from the source domain to a target domain. But with the graph mapper involved, we can actually kind of control the distribution. And I tend to use Bezier for this, but you can explore what happens when you use some of the others. And we're going to use the output of these values to drive our z. And I'm going to go move this point somewhere clear like this. And then this way we'll be able to see the exact effect that we're having. So if you imagine that our numbers are being sort of calculated along this graph, where the x-axis is the input values that we provide, and the y-axis is the output values we provide. This is the graph of their relationship. And that has a direct geometric correlation to how these sort of fall off relative to the location of the point. Meaning, if I make it a little bit higher towards near the point, you can see that this starts to slope up in a similar fashion. If I make it lower over here, we get something that actually follows this general uh, kind of shape. We could do more of like an S and you can see that it starts very, very low, quickly becomes very high and then tapers off at a certain distance. So this gives you a lot of control looking in 3D at how the sort of relative relationship to this attractor point is being handled. So you can kind of eyeball the sorts of height relationships you're interested in. Now, you can play with some of these other graph types. Uh, the sine curve is kind of fun, where it starts out looking like the S curves that we just drew, but if you drag these points around, they now do different things. And you can create you know, a wave relative to the location of that attractor point. And again, as we move this around, it's actually going to sort of create a wave. It's a little hard to see um, radiating out from the center of that point. So that's another, another kind of option. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility uh, when you manipulate this um, that gives you control. Now, some of them will send your values like really, really high, even above and beyond the domain that you specified. So that's something to watch out for. Now we've got a little like mega district over here. Um, but I, ex I encourage you to just sort of play around and explore. I think for practical purposes, Bezier is usually the thing that gives you the control that you need, and it's sort of subtle, um, but there are, there are lots of possibilities with some of the other options in there. So this is cool. This is great. We've got sort of control of the heights of the buildings based on this attractor. What if we wanted to use a curve attractor instead of a point attractor? So instead of using the distance to a single point in space, we wanted to be able to define like some sort of line that maybe ran through the center of it. So let's create a new layer and call it curve. I'm setting this up as a sub layer of attractors and I'm going to draw a curve. And I'm just going to draw something that sort of passes through the center of this like that and we're going to load that into its own param so go to params curve right click set one curve now we've loaded in a reference to it and unfortunately you can't just take the distance from a point to a curve but there is a component that will let us do that and that is the curve closest point component so under curve analysis uh, curve closest point will allow you to take a point or a list of points and a curve and it will find you can see highlighted the closest point on that curve for each one of those points um, it also though outputs the distance so 
if we want to swap this value out, we could sort of wire this into both of these, but there's a shortcut that I find really handy when I'm doing a lot of grasshopper work and sort of rewiring things on the go. If you hold down Control and Shift and then drag from one output or input to another, you can bring all the wires with you. So we can just replace the logic of this point attractor with the logic of a curve attractor and not have to do any additional work, and it all follows. So it is now using the position or location of this curve attractor as the basis now, and you can see that everything sort of dips down right around where that curve attractor is following its shape. Uh, so that's another way to kind of quickly control uh, sort of general modeling. Now, the one last piece of this that we should build in is in addition to being able to control this via a sort of a tractor logic where everything is sort of strictly following this continuous and smooth graph, we might want to introduce a little bit of randomness uh, to make this more believable as sort of a real urban condition. Um, so we're going to look at a different way to produce a list of values which are going to uh, kind of drive our extrusion distance. So I'm going to take all of this and pull it down so we have a little bit of space. And we're going to take the list length of this list, which we know has 59 items, but we need to sort of have that as a numerical value. So uh, I think that's under sets list list length. And then we're going to plug this value in and we'll get back 59. And we're going to use this in tandem with a component that I don't think we've seen yet called random. So also under sets and sequence, we're going to grab the random component, which produces a random value or a list of random values based on the number that you supply. So I'm going to say I need 59 random values and I'm going to leave it at the default range of 0 to, zero to 1. And I'm going to create a seed value, and I'm just going to type in, I don't know, 45. doesn't really matter. The actual value of this doesn't matter. The way randomness works in a computer, it's not actually randomness, and it creates some crazy function that produces values that look random and act random. Um, but the idea of a seed is that you always have the same random result for a given seed. So I can get as many random results as I want, but if I want to return to the set of random values that I had gotten before, if I go back to 45, it'll be exactly the same as it was before. So this is a way to kind of test many different random, random iterations. And we're going to remap this set of values as well. So in fact, we're going to take this entire thing. We've got this remap from sort of 10 to 400. And we're going to just copy it up here and plug these values in. And now we'll be scaling our values from 0 to 1 over here. Now, we could have just provided this domain as the input in the first place, which is totally fine. But I like to do my remapping explicitly so that I always know what I'm getting out of the components that are actually generating sort of numerical values, and then I just sort of control the, the range of them in a second point. It's just sort of a stylistic choice. So if we use this instead as the value to drive our z vector, then you'll see we get a bunch of random heights. Um, and if we alter the seed, we'll get different random configurations. So basically, as many as many sort of random configurations of this model as we would like. And so the last thing we're going to look at in this model is what if we wanted to blend the influences of these two different things. Um, so. Basically, we want to. What if we wanted to control that it was 25% random and 75% controlled by the attractor? So, let's see how we do this. I'm going to take this remap operation and put it at the end, and we're going to do all of our blending and math on values that are in the range from zero to one. So we can actually ignore this guy, and I'm going to delete it. So we know we've got a set of random values over here in the range from 0 to 1, and we've got a series of attractor-controlled values also in the range from 0 to 1 because of the way our graph is set up. And what I want to do is create a slider which will allow me to control the amount of relative influence. So 
the way that we're going to do this is essentially creating a weighted average of these two values. So let's see how that's done. We're going to multiply. I'm just double clicking and typing the star as a shortcut to the multiplication component, or you can go over to math operators multiply. I'm going to multiply the random values times this slider. And then I'm going to take a one. I'm going to just put a panel down and put one in it and do one minus this value. So again, double click, type a hyphen in order to get subtraction, or you can go over to maths to grab subtraction from here. So if I do one minus this value, uh, these two will always add up to one, of course. And so I'm going to take this value and multiply that by the attractor point logic. So when I'm all the way over here, this is just going to be zero and this is just going to be one. So we're just going to have the attractor point values. And when I go uh, all the way to one, I've got my randomness values and all of these are zero. So if I add them together, uh, using the addition component over here, I essentially have controlled a weighted average of the two. Um, and I know that they'll always still be in the range from zero to one because of the way I set up these sliders. So I'm going to plug this value now into our remap where we scale those values. And when we're all the way at one, we're all the way at randomness. And when we're all the way at zero, we're all the way at attractor logic. So this is a way that we can introduce small amounts of randomness into our attractor logic to make it a little bit more believable. Um, you know, the difference between this, where everything sort of follows that slope exactly. And let me just, uh, I'll move this aside just so that it's a little bit easier to see. Yeah, so this is the sort of pure attractor logic. And then as soon as we introduce a little bit more randomness, it has a little more character and feels a little bit more real. So there's a lot that can be done because essentially all of this is just math. All we're ever doing when we're dealing with attractors is creating a list of numbers, which is going to control some geometric property of the things we're dealing with, in this case, building height. And so we can control a point attractor, we can control a curve attractor, and then we can add randomness and we can blend those together. You could start to use various analysis values. You could use data from GIS. Anything that you can turn into a list of numbers that corresponds to your geometry, you can then use and blend in order to create geometric conditions that respond to those values. The last thing I want to show you in this tutorial is that other grasshopper file that we have in the source files called adding detail. And I'm not going to show you the details of how to construct this. Um, I just want to walk through it really briefly. This was an example that I set up for actually a course on data structures. Um, and I wanted to show how kind of different parts of a model could be processed using different logic, but your sort of data structure could still be preserved. But in any case, I think it's an interesting case study on how you might structure uh, the kind of automatic creation of detail from something very simple. So we're also, in this definition, we're dealing with something that you may not have seen yet called a cluster. This looks like a big old component, but when I hover over it, you'll see that there's a kind of little preview. And if I double click it, you can start to deconstruct the logic of it. So if you're interested in how any of these are constructed, you can get in there and see what it's doing. And then any of these uh, sort of light gray arrows become outputs on the component and these dark gray arrows become inputs. So if we return, we can click on any of these clusters to understand how the sort of geometric logic is being processed. So this is a good way to keep definitions organized. So I'm taking a rectangle as input. I'm generating some districts. I'm generating some parcels within those districts. I'm generating some plots within those parcels. And then color coding them according to what I've set up as kind of a schema of uh, land use, essentially. So what, what kinds of programs are going on to these parcels? So then I'm splitting those out into different lists according to these values and using a different cluster for each one to automatically generate geometry um, for that program type, essentially, in addition to adding some randomness. 
So each one of these is also a cluster, and some of them are quite large and complicated. Um, but if you're interested in kind of playing around with them, um, they're, they're each kind of interesting in their own right in terms of automatically generating geometry from an arbitrary boundary. And altogether, they provide a way to produce, uh, you know, a fairly ugly but, but somewhat detailed model that is genuinely created entirely in Grasshopper. So just from a kind of series of 2D profiles, because remember, that's all we've got at this point, each one of these can render out additional detail, creating kind of building masses with different characters and different sorts of details and balcony conditions and, you know, a little, little ugly little park and things like that. So um, feel free to poke around at this definition if you're interested in techniques for that. It would be a lot to go over uh, any one of these in detail. You can see there's sort of a lot going on inside and they're not the best sort of organized or annotated. Um, but the other thing about this is that uh, you should be able to take uh, these structures and provide any sort of uh, polyline input you want. So if I just draw a polyline like this and I'll load it in using a curve parameter, and we're going to use this office cluster. I'm going to make a copy of it and plug it in. And at least in theory, this should generate a kind of office building from that profile. Um, now, I would encourage you to customize these if you do intend to use them. Um, and feel free to use them and manipulate them as you like. Um, but they're, you know, probably shouldn't just use them as is, mostly because what they produce is really ugly. Um, but just wanted to show that to you in case you're interested in creating sort of more detailed representations parametrically.